Father, I pray today would be the day that you would break free that thing that has a hold of them that makes them think that they need one foot in and one foot out. Help them to understand that everything they want, everything they need, everything that makes them complete is found right here in your presence, Lord. That they don't need to search for it elsewhere. But God, you are their everything. You want to be their everything. We thank you for that, Jesus. Uh, Let that truth penetrate our hearts. Holy Spirit, speak. You're the only voice we need to hear. God, speak to every situation, every different, unique circumstance and scenario. Speak to every individual heart and mind today. I I pray this church would experience the, the freedom that comes from knowing that you're enough. And they can lay down the things that they've been unnecessarily carrying. Be our everything, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated this morning. Thank you, worship team, for leading us into the presence of Jesus. And I'm excited to share a word that I believe uh, uniquely ties into these uh, passages. Let's give it up for Garrison. He avoided a huge disaster. That would have been epically, awesomely bad. But he saved it. He rescued the moment. Man, God is good. God is good. It's always hard to transition from a moment like that in worship, but I believe that where God is going to take us this morning in, in his scripture today is going to bring us right back there. <laughs> that we're not, we're not stepping away from anything right now, but this is an opportunity to, to be in his presence even longer. If you're here today for the first time, you're joining us on part six of a series we've been going through called The God Man. We've been uh, focusing on Jesus as the light and how John in his gospel uses the term light well over 20 times to describe Jesus because Jesus is a revelation of who God is and who man was meant to be. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about how he not only came and shined his light, but he continues to shine his light today. We see Jesus as a floodlight who reveals his love for the entire sinful world, right? It lights up the darkest of every situation. We just have to determine, are we going to let the light in? We see God as a spotlight that not only floods up all the dark areas, but has the ability to look at you as the individual and to even look upon your heart. He knows you by name. We've talked about Jesus as the highlight who reveals himself as a God of grace in the midst of your shame. In other words, he chooses to highlight his grace rather than your sin and your shame and your failures. We've talked about Jesus as the first light, revealing himself as the God who brings purpose out of your pain and how he uses dark situations often to reveal himself for the very first time. For many of us, he's made an introduction with us during the darkest time of our life. And today, I want to talk to you about seeing him as a light that doesn't come and go, but as a light that we can plug into, revealing himself as the one who remains within us and never needs to grow dim. The choice is up to us. You know, I have at home a battery-powered blower. And the reason why I purchased this battery-powered blower is because we have trees that uh, drop a lot of leaves everywhere. And I got a neighbor who does not like my leaves in his yard. And so I try to keep those under control. And it was driving me crazy because my first leaf blower was electric. And so it was always attached to a cord, okay? And so here I am blowing the leaves and I find myself uh, running out of room and then I have to go and unplug it and put it in a different outlet. And then every once in a while I would pop the circuit on that GFI switch or whatever, right? And then I have to go push that again. And then I'd find myself uh, getting the cord tangled up and it was just the most frustrating thing in the world for me. And I said to myself, this is ridiculous. There's got to be something more. There's got to be something better. And so I purchased this battery-powered blower and it was wonderful. 
I was like, this is so cool. And the first time I charged it and I turned it on, um, it, it blew way harder than the electric blower. And I was like, wow, this is powerful. And it's just, I'm creating this huge whirlwind of leaves in my yard. And I'm like feeling like a pretty cool dude, you know. And then I realized that the battery um, is strong enough to do the front yard, but it does not last long enough to do the backyard and the front yard all in one charge. And so if you find yourself on a windy day, then you find yourself having to stop before the job is done, wait an hour or two for the battery to recharge. Meanwhile, all the leaves that you had just taken care of are being blown about the neighborhood by the wind. And so I thought to myself, was this a smart purchase? But there's something about that story that relates today because I begin to see that cord as a leash as a, a source of limitations rather than the source of power that it actually was. See, I had everything I needed to do the job before I started looking elsewhere. I just needed to stay plugged in. And so often that is how we treat our relationship with Jesus, don't we? We look at our, our connection with him as a religious duty, and so it becomes a leash to us. And that is the religious point of view. That when I see it as, as, as a, not a source of power, but as a source of restriction, right? I think that's the view that a lot of people outside of the church have about Christianity, is that God is, is just the judge that sits on high, who wants to make sure he limits the amount of fun that you have and, and, and limits the amount of pleasures that you can enjoy on this earth, and that if you prove yourself to him, he might let you into his kingdom, and then we look at the Bible, even in the church, we can fall victim to this. We think that this is a rule book, right, that just, that just limits uh, what we can do. But what we don't realize is that our connection with God is a source of power. It's a relationship. He's a personal God. This is the relationship perspective, understanding that everything God has for me comes from this connection that I find myself in my human nature constantly wanting to free myself of. It's ironic, isn't it? That in, in search of freedom, we find ourselves wanting to be free from God when in reality, freedom is found when we are connected to him. Amen. And we go through this madness even in the church. Let's be honest. The madness of trying to be a Christian in our own strength. And what happens is we go through this process where we find ourselves frustrated because on Sunday we heard a message that challenged our hearts and we may have even come to the altar and made a commitment to God and said, God, this is the way that I want to live. And then we go out and we fail and we find out this is a lot harder than I thought. Or um, I loved being in the presence of Jesus on Sunday, but getting up at 5 a.m. on a Monday, I'm suddenly not in the mood to be in the presence of Jesus. Am I getting real this morning? And so we find ourselves living this life of this battery-powered Christian where we go through the week and the life kicks our behinds. And we're exhausted and we're worn down and we're screaming at people in traffic and we're yelling at our kids and we're not acting like Jesus. And then we come to church and we repent of all the things that we did and we get recharged and we say, okay, I'm ready to do it all over again. It's just this mad cycle that we just keep going through again and again and again. But what if we didn't have to recharge? What if we could just stay plugged in? What if we didn't have to just run until we're dry, and then fill up again. What if we could stay plugged in? So before I get into the truth of God's word, I want to find out what you guys think, okay? So we're going to discuss this question at our tables. How in the past have you viewed your relationship with God? Has it been as a leash or as a source of power? Now, you know what the right answer is, but I want you to take an honest look at your life. If someone were to, to look at the way I live, am I living as a battery Christian? Or am I living as a plugged in Christian? And a lot of that might have to do with how I view my relationship with God. Is it a leash? Is it a religion? Or is it a relationship and a source of power? So let's take some time to discuss this at our tables. And then I'm really excited to share with you what God's word says.
Um, we had some great discussion at our table. Uh, at our table, I was reminded about how sometimes we can plug into ourselves, and that's when we realize we've unplugged, right? So suddenly we realize that we're depending on our own strength to do the things of God, which is kind of silly when you think about it, but raise your hand if you're guilty. Okay, yep, most of you, all of you, the rest of you are lying, so that's a whole other problem, <laughs> whole other problem. But let's be honest, we all understand this struggle because we're human beings. It's, it happens in every stage of life. When you're young, teenagers, do I have any teenagers in the room today? A couple? Yeah, there you are. They're all working and serving, running cameras and stuff. Let's give it up for our young people. But you know what? When we're young, we know what it's like. We know what the struggle is between flesh and, and, and spirit, right? The, the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We get in trouble at school or at home, and uh, we feel maybe we're struggling and feeling completely controlled by a secret sin in our life, and we try harder because we want to do what's right, and, and we may even have faith in God as young people, and so we, we try really hard. And we think that's the key, right? We just have to try harder. But what happens is we end up doing the same thing over and over again. We end up running out of gas and repeating this maddening process again. It took me a while to learn to abide. As a teenager, I really struggled with that, to, to learn what it means to remain in his presence. And as a young person, I remember finding my place in different seasons where I eventually began to give up and accept the fact that this is just a part of who I am. This is just a part of my identity. Well, I got some news for you students. It's not. It's a lie. You've just come unplugged. When you're single, struggling with loneliness and, and begging God to bring you your true love, all the while he's offering you the truest love every single day and you're not taking him up on that offer, struggling so hard in your own effort to fill that emptiness that you turn to other things. It leads you to search in all the wrong places. You start looking for single guys or single girls at the bar because there aren't any at your church and you get all confused as to why you can't find a good person and why every relationship is ending in disaster. That really struck somebody's funny bone back there. Or we turn to other things to fill that void like porn or alcohol or some other substance and it seems like we just keep falling short. Well, guess what? You've come unplugged. As a man, we so often let the cares of this world steal uh, our hearts and minds away. That tug I was talking about earlier, it's like there's something always pulling on us and we become too busy um, to become the men that God has created us to be. How ironic is that? It's the only thing that matters, and yet we're too busy to do it. We dedicate our time and effort wanting to provide a better life for our family. But all the while, what our family really needs is withering away before their very eyes. They need to see a man who is abiding in the presence of Jesus. You've come unplugged. As a woman, you can share some of the same struggles, but there's other things as well. Perhaps your cares are different, but the effect is still the same. You can put so much care into, into how you look or how other people perceive you. Trying to set a godly example for your kids is a noble effort, right? But if you do it in your own flesh and you do it in your own effort, then you're going to struggle. All your efforts are going to be in vain if you find yourself unplugged. And so when I think of what this means, I think about tea. I started making tea recently um, because um, let's just say that coffee has not been kind to my stomach. And so I've been, I've been trying out different teas and things like that. But some people just don't know how to make tea. These are the dippers. These are the people that think that you can create tea by just dipping in and then pulling it back out again. Okay? I want to give you a challenge this morning, church. Don't be a Sunday dipper with your relationship with Jesus. Or worse, don't be a bi-weekly dipper like some of you are, right? And so I can take this tea bag and I can dip it into the water here even a few times and a bunch of times. But you know what? I don't see the water changing color, do I? Do I have tea? Have I successfully created tea? There's something that's keeping the tea, the water from turning into tea. There's two things that should be very obvious. 
One, it doesn't have the ability to absorb because of the time that the bag is in the water. This is not a very uh, large amount of time, and I, now I have them tied together, so that's messed up. There we go. This is not enough time, quite obviously, we're doing a scientific experience, not enough time to turn the color of the water, let alone to make it into tea. But there's something else that's missing. Not only is it unable to absorb because of time, it's because the time is brief and the water is lukewarm. And so what so often happens is as we treat our relationship with God as the, the grandpa that we visit on the weekends, that we understand that we, we, we are lacking a passion and a desire to get to know him better. And so that's when our water becomes lukewarm. And so because heat is required to absorb and properly steep the contents of the bag into the water, nothing's happening. There's no change, there's no transformation taking place. And oftentimes we are dippers for different reasons. We are dippers because so often we, hear, we feel the world pulling against us. And so we talked about a leash earlier. We have a different kind of leash. And it's the pull and the lure of the things of this world. Because there's certain things that you cannot partake of. There's certain things that you cannot fully enjoy unless you remove yourself from the presence of God. Let's just be honest here this morning. Now, there's certain places where if you take Jesus in there with you, you're not going to enjoy it. Where if you keep your thoughts fixed on him, you're not going to be able to enjoy what you're about to partake in. And so we become dippers. We wait until we experience the world on the outside until finally we feel so dry that we no longer have life in us. And so we say, okay, we, it's time to take another dip. And that's how we live our Christian life. But did I make tea, church? Is anybody going to want to drink that? Is anybody going to say, hmm, that looks tasty? Is it going to possess any flavor? Is it going to possess any of the health benefits that are often a part of tea? No, it's not. See, there's certain things that we can only partake in when we leave the presence of Jesus behind. I want to challenge you this morning very simply to stay connected. To stay connected. We're going to go right into the scripture today. We're going to be in John chapter 15. If you want to follow along your Bibles, you can turn there right now. But before we get to that, let me share with you a little bit about the context of this passage. Because as you know, we're in the Gospel of John, but we're skipping around a little bit. Okay? So let me try to fill in a little bit of the blanks. What Jesus is about to share with the disciples here is one of his final teachings before his death. And the awareness of how close the hour was, was heavy upon Jesus' mind. And how many of you know that when you're facing the end of something, and maybe you've never faced death before, but you're facing the end of your time with someone you, you care about very, very much, suddenly the conversation shifts to what's really important. Suddenly it's very important what you leave that person that you care about with. What are your final words going to be? And this is what Jesus is finding himself in as the hour approaches. He knows that he's going to die. He knows that his disciples aren't going to understand, that they're going to feel abandoned. They're not going to understand how the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords could be defeated at a cross, and, and they're going to be scattered, and they're going to be confused. And so he has to plant this truth in their minds before this all happens. He wants them to know that after he's gone, they'll still be able to remain with him through the Holy Spirit. He talks about the Holy Spirit, chapter 14. He, he'll continue to talk about the Holy Spirit all the way through chapter 17. But it says here at the end of chapter 14, verses 30 and 31, check this out. It says, I don't have much more time to talk to you. When somebody says that, what do you do? You lean in. You pay close attention because you understand the situation. You understand where the person is coming from. You understand the gravity of the situation. And you say, I better listen. Man, it's so easy for us to just come to church and not listen sometimes, isn't it? It's so easy for us even sometimes to go through our, our daily devotionals or readings and not take the time to truly listen what the Holy Spirit is trying to say. See, Jesus was about to impart something powerful and transformational in their lives. 
He says, I don't have much more time to talk to you, so what I'm about to say is big. And he says this, because the ruler of this world approaches. He's talking about Satan. He has no power over me, which is going to be something very important for them to remember as he's about to be crucified. But I will do what the Father requires of me so that the world will know that I love the Father. The most important thing to Jesus in this moment was that the world would know that he loves the Father. And he was going to give the disciples here the key so that they could live lives in such a way that the world will know that they love the Father as well. And so he says in John 15, starting in verse 1, and I'll go ahead and just read the first eight verses here. Jesus said, I am the true grapevine, and my Father is the gardener. For he cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I've given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who remain in me, and I in them, will produce much fruit. How much fruit? Okay, that sounds cool. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So with him, will produce much. Apart from him, nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce uh, much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to the Father. I am the grapevine and my Father is the gardener. He's painting a picture of his role and the Father's role. He gives us insight that the Son connects us and keeps us connected in relationship with the Father. And the Father is the one that helps us grow. He makes us more like his son. There's five things that I'm going to point out to you as we go through this passage that result from this connection. Staying connected, remaining in him, or as other translations would say, abiding. The first is this, production. He wants us to produce To the point where he says in verse 2 that the gardener, the father, cuts off every branch that doesn't produce fruit. It is unnatural for the branch of a fruit tree to not produce fruit. And that is why it is pruned so it can produce even more. This is the natural function of a tree branch, right? Or in this case, the, the branch of a vine is to produce fruit. Fruit will naturally contain the characteristics of the tree. That's why you don't get apples from orange trees and orange, oranges from apple trees, right? Because what is being produced is actually containing the characteristics of the tree. But I have never, ever seen someone cut off a branch and then it, 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 it bud a piece of fruit that then ripens and becomes something that we can eat. And so it happens as we are connected to the vine, we take upon the characteristics of God and those begin to produce fruit that is tasty and provides nourishment to others. Fruit isn't there to just look at, is it? Our neighbor has a grapefruit tree that hangs over our yard. And so we can have all the grapefruits we want. (laughs) Disgusting. If you like grapefruit, I don't know what your problem is. Like the only way to eat grapefruit is to like cover it with two pounds of sugar, right? And eat it with a spoon. And it's like, I'm just eating sugar right now. So as a result, what happens to that fruit on our side is it falls to the ground and it begins to rot and the bugs get to it. And what you have is just disgusting mess on the ground um, in your backyard And then I make my son go out and pick it up and he freaks out about it because he's like, there's bugs in it. But that's not the purpose of fruit, is it? The purpose of fruit is to provide nourishment for others. 
you got to understand that Jesus' heart is not just for you, but it's for others. And he wants you to produce fruit because his heart is for those that are not connected to the vine to be connected to the vine. So number one is production. Number two is pruning. What's interesting about this is whether you are connected to the vine or not, or whether you're producing, I should say this, whether you're producing fruit or not, you get cut. That stinks. Like, Jesus, I'm doing what you told me to do. I'm producing fruit. Why am I still getting cut? It says that he prunes the branches that do bear fruit. Why? So that they will produce more. See, pruning is the act of cutting away what hinders production. See, there are things in your life that you found a way to justify. Like, the Bible doesn't clearly call this sin, but they're holding you back. They're making you a dipper. They're robbing your thoughts. They're taking away your focus to the point where you're not abiding. You've forgotten what it even means to remain in the presence of God. See, what so often happens is just like this water is lukewarm and it's not um, using the heat to help absorb the contents of the bag and spread it throughout the water, so often we find ourselves in a situation where the heat has been turned up and we turn into dippers. We pull ourselves out of the situation because that's hot. This is difficult. And then we get angry in that, right? We say, God, why are you letting this happen to me, forgetting that it's in the heat that the, the characteristics of God are drawn out into our lives? It's in the cutting that we grow, who grows in the good times? Seriously, that's like saying, I anticipate getting a six-pack by sitting on the couch drinking a six-pack. It just doesn't work that way. How, how do I get uh, this, this physique that is the envy of others, which I'm not saying I have one, I'm just saying, right? I do it through pain, through suffering. It is the breaking down of the muscle tissue that's building me up and making me stronger and growing me. But if we remove ourselves from the pruning, we're missing out on what God created us to do. Let me encourage you with this this morning. If you're being pruned, rejoice because it means you're connected to the vine. Because you cannot grow without the cutting. So here's something you need to remember. You're either going to be cut or pruned. Either way, you're going to experience pain. I don't know about you. I'd rather be pruned. So why does he do it? It says in verse 2, so that they will produce even more. Number three is this, progress. God's heart is for you to experience progress. We are pruned to produce more fruit. See, God is not satisfied that we produce. He wants us to produce even more. But here's the problem. So often, the result of being a dipper is we become satisfied. This is long enough. And there's, you know, I don't know if you can tell from there, but there's just the slightest little hint of tea barely forming. I'm good. And we feel that tug again attached to us and we remove ourselves Again, and you're like, you know what? Look, that's starting to resemble tea. I have arrived. And yet I still haven't created anything that's going to be tasteful or useful or beneficial to anyone else. We're, pr we're pruned so we can produce more. We need to stop as a church being satisfied with good enough. This isn't a works-based theology or anything like that. It's simply understanding that as we remain in him, he produces more and more. He's a God of the abundance. He's the God that blesses to make us a blessing. He's a God that doesn't waste our pain, but he uses our struggles to make us stronger and to, to help us be able to speak into the lives of other people. Then he goes on to say, All, uh, you've already been pruned by the message I have given you. See, when someone surrenders their life to Jesus, there's a pruning that takes place right then. You can't come to Jesus without laying your life down. Understanding, you laid your life down for me. Now I give you mine. But that is only the beginning. 
How many of you like fruit? Like, even if it's just like one kind, you like fruit, right? Fruit's good. It's sweet. It's like, it's like a healthy way to like eat sugar, right? I'm sure you could probably eat too much of it. Like if, you, if you're Tim Slack, that dude, he's, we tell him he's fruity all the time because he just, uh, he shows up to the life group and he eats the entire fruit plate, right? There's no fruit left for anyone else, right? Why am I saying that? Well, because I'm weird, but number two, because fruit is good. So what God is wanting for you is more good things in your life. He's wanting to see more of himself in you. And so the pruning is a result of him desiring to pour out more upon you. It's a result of him desiring to see you flourish even more. And maybe with that mentality, we can accept it and endure it more. He says, remain in me and I will remain in you. Number four is this, a personal relationship. As you remain in him, you experience a personal relationship. That word remain means quite simply to stay or to abide. That means Jesus doesn't want you going anywhere. At first, I was just going to settle on this phrase. He wants to hang out with you. I heard somebody say that once. He wants to hang with you, which is true, but this is so much more than that. He wants you to have a vital connection to him. Because as a branch doesn't, you know, disconnect from the vine and then come back again and disconnect and come, come back again, he wants you to take him with you wherever you go. And the fact that it says that if you remain in me, I will remain in you, it points us towards the relational uh, characteristic of God, that both you and he play a part. The Bible says, draw near to him and he will draw near to you. He wants you to hang out with him, but also to take him with you wherever you go. How many of you know that dipping is not the right way to make tea? We don't need to dip. We need to steep. Now here, you probably heard me turn this on a little bit earlier, is a kettle. And this makes hot water really, really quickly. So now, you know, sometimes you got to bring a little passion and desire to your relationship with Jesus, amen? And that's represented by the heat here. Do you see that steam rising? Anybody cold you want to sip? See, so many of us have grown cold in our relationship with Jesus. And it's happened because um, some of it is just the separation of time and, 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 and through that process we've become lukewarm and we've lost our desire. But steeping is the right way to make tea. See, what steeping means is it's defined as quite simply the process of taking the solids of the inside of this bag and drawing its qualities out into the water. Jesus wants you to be a steeping Christian. See, we need both heat and we need submersion. That means that we need desire. We need hunger as well as we need closeness and intimacy. We need to remain in close proximity to him because when we remain in him, there is a transformation that takes place. The scriptures say, in him we live and move and have our being. And so we take him with us wherever we go. And what's, what's crazy is, have you ever gone underwater and noticed how you can't hear what's happening above the surface? Or when you do, it's just muffled, but it just sounds like background noise. And yet there's things you can hear beneath the surface of the water that you can't hear above the surface. See, because everything that you need is found right here. Everything that God wants to give you, the answer to every problem that you face, everything you're struggling with is found here. You say, Joe, it's not that simple. Oh, yes, it is. When Jesus walked this earth and he arrived, it was the announcement that victory was there. And that if he said it, then it was a done deal. Whatever it is that you face, whatever it is that is your big struggle, am I just simply saying, hey, if you pray more, it'll all go away? Not necessarily, but kind of. 
It's not just about praying, though. It's about being in his presence. As we just live and move in him and we hunger for him and we take him with us everywhere we go and we resist the urge to be pulled out. We allow him to prune us. Because see, while, while, just as um, the water is being transformed into tea right now, this is where the pruning takes place. This is where God says, you know what? Uh, for you to um, truly experience what I want for you, you gotta cut this out of your life. And, and, and if you wanna stop living this same pattern of, of, of uh, sin in your life, there's some things that you're just gonna need to cut out. You know, for you, I think you just need to actually cut the cord to internet for a while, right? Or, or for you, I think, I think you just need to, to uh, uh, uninstall the Netflix app on your phone, right? Or for you, I think you, need to, I think you need to just stop, you know, drinking casually because you realize that it's, it's causing problems and it's not helping, that you don't need to turn to alcohol for comfort. You need to turn to me. And so you need to cut alcohol completely out of your life. He says those things to us here beneath the surface. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. But my faith would be made stronger. I often say that we sing about oceans, but all we really want to do is splash around in puddles. Because it's beneath the surface where all I am becomes all he is, where all I hear is his voice, where the rest of the world just becomes faded uh, in the past and muffled white noise. And I can hear clearly and I can see clearly. But on top of that, look what I have produced. A perfectly good cup of tea. See, when we remain in him, we're promised that we will bear fruit. And not just some fruit, but much fruit. See, nobody wants to drink the dipper's tea. Are you producing something in your life that people want to partake of? Something that is pleasing to their eye. Something that looks a little bit different than what they've already experienced in this world. Something that, that sounds different, that talks different, that listens differently and more intently. They see something in you that's not like them, that's not like the rest of the world. You're so much more than a sinner saved by grace. I don't even like that term. I don't. Like... Where does it say that we're still sinners? Maybe you guys can show me later where it says that you're still a sinner. We were set free from sin. It doesn't mean that we never sin. But that's not my identity, and I'm not claiming that. Hi, I'm a sinner saved by grace. No, I'm a saint. Because he has made me a saint. And I can abide in him to the point where I become so much like him that I produce something that people want. People say, I want that. I need that in my life. But it comes not by being a dipper. You gotta be a steeper. He says in verse four, a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed. It needs to remain. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain. You gotta stay. You gotta stay here. Verse 5 says, those who remain will produce much fruit. I love that we watch this progression through these, these verses. We go from fruit to even more fruit to much fruit. This is the pattern that we're supposed to be on. This is what takes place here in the abiding. Because as you watch this, you saw the water turn light brown to medium brown to a darker brown. It had some tea, and then it had more tea, and now it has much tea. And it's something that can be enjoyed. I don't care how long you've been following Jesus, you don't reach a point where he wants you to stop growing, where he wants you to stop producing even more fruit. I want you to turn to somebody next to you and say, he's got more for you. But he says in verse 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. 
Efforts to produce fruit outside of him will instead cause us to produce fruit that is bitter. We become religious, and religion leads to judgment and self-righteousness and division. And I think a lot of that has happened in the church, which has led to a lot of people's opinions of the church today. That's the type of life that produces this type of tea. This is not appealing to anybody in the room. Francis Chan puts it this way. He says that when it comes down to it, in all reality, the majority of Christians, people don't see anything appealing about our life. And so what happens is we come across as a salesman peddling a product that didn't work for ourselves. I want to tell you about the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to tell you about this better life that you can have. And it's written here in this book. But I can't tell the difference between me and you. Anyone, he says in verse 6, who does not remain is thrown away and withers. It's impossible not to wither when you become disconnected. If you cut a piece of a plant off and you just set it down, what happens? It turns from green to yellow and from yellow to brown. See, the process can be reversed. If that wasn't the case, then I can't make sense of this passage whatsoever. The process can be reversed as we disconnect from the vine, as we go from uh, no fruit to some fruit to more fruit to much fruit. As we become disconnected, the result is we begin to wither and we begin to die. It's impossible not to wither when you become disconnected. And it says the fate of these things in in verse 6, these types of branches, it said are gathered into a pile to be burned. This is the part in the message where we start to squirm a little and really like, Pastor Joe, this was going so good. And until you got to this, and are you seriously about to talk about hell? Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> this is the fate of those who do not remain. It's undoubtedly a reference to hell. I don't see how you can read it any other way. But listen, this is not God saying, all right, you have not done good enough, so I'm going to cut you off and I'm going to throw you into the fire. This is a simple uh, matter of whether or not you are grafted into the vine or not. Because if you're grafted into the vine, the result of your salvation will show itself. It's not, I have to produce this much fruit to make sure I stay grafted into the vine. No, 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 no. That's legalism. It's, I am grafted in the vine, and so naturally it shows itself in the fruit that I produce. This is Satan's trap, though, that he lays for us. He wants us to be a dipper. He wants to keep this leash on us so that we're constantly um, being tugged in between two different worlds. But some of us, we just need to allow ourselves to be pruned and say, okay, God, I'm all in. Let me abide in you. Satan wants to lure you in, watch you wither, and see you completely overcome by sin. Because just as the effects of abiding can cause you to produce fruit or a delicious cup of tea, there are three things that happen and result from being disconnected, and they are as follows. Fruitlessness, withering, and eventually death. Fruitlessness, withering, and eventually death. So let me make it positive again for those of you that are like, Joe, this is too harsh. A spoonful of sugar helps the truth of God's word go down. By the grace of God, you can be grafted in. See, I wasn't born into the vine. I was born a sinner. And I was grafted in. We have a tradition here at the fountain where we, when we have a new members class, we give everybody a plant. Oh, that's cool. It's even cooler because the plants that we give out all come from the same plant. So what happens is my wife takes the plant. She takes one of the branches off. She sticks it in water and it begins to grow its own roots. Then she takes that plant, plants it into some new soil, and it becomes a brand new plant. And the symbolism is obvious that 
as we become rooted in God's family, we all become a part of one another and we grow together as we're rooted in God's word. That's what I believe God wants to do for somebody today. If you're somebody that has experienced some withering right now, I can testify to this. I know what it feels like to feel like you're withering. Even when, you feel, even when you're connected to your purpose, right? And you're stepped into what God has called you to do. As Carissa was sharing at my table, you can plug into yourself and all of a sudden you're like, I'm withering. What's going on? Where did I get off track? But we know the heart of the Father is to leave the 99, to come after the one that was lost. Today could be that moment for you. See, the vine can live without the branch, but the branch cannot live without the vine. It has to be grafted in. See, I think some of us make the mistake of when we read passages like this through Scripture, we see them as, as optional. Like, here's how you live as a casual Christian, and here's how you live if you want to be a super Christian. And so we'll read these passages and glaze over them because like, yeah, that's pretty extreme. Like, I want my pastor to live that way. You know, I want my youth leader to live that way. Um, I want my parents to live that way. But hey, I'm just a kid, right? Or I'm just a, church, a regular church attender, you know? Like, I'll stand at the front, I'll greet, you know, I'll, I'll serve, I'll help out a little bit. I'll produce some fruit, but I'm not into this whole pruning thing. I'm not into this whole more thing or much fruit thing. Like some people are called to do that and other people are just called just to be a good person. So when you find that verse, please show it to me because that would just make life so much easier. And yet I would be robbing myself of the best things that God has for me. He's not saying remain in me if you want to be a super Christian. He's saying, remain in me or wither and die. There's no in between because honestly, that's the devil's trap. He, he, he's not just going to come into the, the person that's just abiding in Christ and just be like, hey, look, you know, throw your life away and just give it to me and I'll give you all the riches and everything. You can have all the pleasures in all the world, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden, boom. It's like the song says, it's a slow fade when you give yourself away. It happens slowly, and so the devil comes and he tempts and he gets you to kind of get distracted. He he turns you into a dipper, and he keeps pulling you out of the presence of God and getting you interested in other things, and then you find yourself dry and withering, and then his hope is just to pounce on you and to destroy you. When sin's work is complete, the Bible says it gives birth to what? Anybody know? To death. This isn't what he wants. You're either withering or you're producing much fruit. And if you're in between, you're heading one way or you're heading the other. There's no middle ground. Jesus didn't die on a cross so we could live in middle ground. Jesus didn't give of his life and shed every last drop of his blood for us so that we could be casual Christians. We must be vitally connected. In other words, we depend on him for everything. In him we live and move and have our being. We depend on him for everything. We draw strength from him. We find joy in him. We seek wisdom from him. We get direction from him. We grow in him. That's what he wants for all of us. Because outside of a close relationship with Jesus, a Christian withers and dies. Lastly, he says, if you remain in me, ask anything and it will be granted. This uh, probably should be a separate sermon. But number five is this, power. Power results from remaining in the vine. I mean, am I understanding this correctly? I know people get tripped up with this because they're like, okay, so like, isn't that just back to works again? You know, because like, if you pray enough, if you believe enough, I've heard that before. People use that to manipulate people and blah, 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 blah. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about what comes naturally. If a branch is connected to a vine, guess what? Fruit's going to grow. And if we're connected to God, our faith is going to grow. 
Our prayers will become more effective. We will learn to pray the right way because now we understand what His will is because we're submerged to where all we can hear is His voice. We're silencing the outside. I can't help. I can't. Don't tell me I can spend time in in the presence of Jesus and still coming out looking more like this. It's just not what happens. God has so much more for us. He wants to unleash power in your life, but it only comes from abiding. He wants to make your prayers more effective. He wants to make your life more effective. We're talking about growth. See, the power is found in the combination. It says, if I remain in you, and now he says, and my words remain in you. If you remain in me and my words remain in you. See, the power is found in the combination. His words combined with your obedience to those words. When we do this, we unlock the power to bear more fruit. Verse 80 says, when you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. And he says, our lives will bring glory to the Father, which is why we were called, which is why we were set apart. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? I just want to extend to you an invitation. Actually, you know what? Stand, stand. You don't have to bow your heads. Stand with me. I think sometimes we bow our heads so that we can make a halfway commitment. I challenge you this morning to produce fruit, to embrace his pruning, to continue to grow to be intimately and personally relationally close to him and to allow him to unleash the power of your life so father right now I pray over every person in the audience Lord and I pray Lord Jesus that the truth of this word would just sink in so deep and um, God we would become abiders ones that are vitally connected to you that we allow you to cut the things out that keep us from staying submerged and surrounded by your presence allow you to prune us allow you to do that work within us understanding that what you want for us is better so father this morning as we come forward and we sing god i pray that people would lay stuff down that they're holding on to that keeps them tethered to this world and keeps them living the lifestyle of a dipper. And Jesus, we take this moment right now to just steep, to steep in your presence so that the characteristics and the qualities of Jesus would be drawn into us and make us more like you. In Jesus' name, as the team begins to lead us, I just invite you to find a place to be alone with the Lord at your table, at the front, at the sides. And as we sing this song, would you just steep in his presence and you, would you respond to the challenge he's placed upon your heart today? And don't leave this place without making a commitment to remain in him. Let's worship him.
presence, God, uh, to just steep and just help us to become steepers, understanding that if we only experience this once a week, then we're not steeping, we're dipping. But God, we can have this experience with you wherever we go. I pray for a church, God, that would take you along with them in their commute to work. God, that would make you a part of their conversation at lunch. That would fill their heads with your word, with songs of praise and worship. And not so much the things of this world. Help us to not be deceived into the thinking that we need our downtime. Jesus, you're in our downtime. God, you're with us. And God, I just ask that you would just quiet the noise of this world for us and that this world would no longer have such a pull that we find ourselves justifying the reason why we're drifting away, becoming disconnected. Help us to realize, God, that we are vitally connected. That we can't survive without you. That we'll either produce much fruit or we'll begin to wither. And I thank you, God, for a church that's hungry for your presence. It's hungry for you. It desires to abide in you. So, Father, I say this all the time, but so much more today, let this truth sink in that when they leave this place, they take the presence of Jesus with them wherever they go. And that's an opportunity to bear fruit with the rest of the world. It's an opportunity to to live a life that's appealing to those who are lost, those who are seeking. Empower this church, God. Let us be both disciplined and also hungry for our time with you. We thank you for that, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, praise God. He's good, isn't he? It's great to be in his presence. All right, so how many, how many steepers do we now have in the room? All right. Ooh, yes, I love it when I see two hands. That means you got it twice. Praise God. We love you guys. I hope you have an incredible uh, rest of your day, rest of your week. He's got his iced tea. He's ready to go. So God bless you guys. We look forward to seeing you again next time. Take his presence with you wherever you go.